Boing, 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 let's do this boing. In this video, we're gonna look at a dead easy way to create your very own external hardware spring reverb unit that requires no soldering, no circuit building, in fact, not even a screwdriver. If you can plug a cable in, then you can do this for as little as 20 quid. And if you've got a spare or broken guitar amp laying around, then maybe even for free. Spring reverbs are classics and they were invented way back in 1939 by the Hammond Organ Company to go in their organs. The early units were large necklace affairs and these were later replaced by the now familiar reverb tanks or trays. Hammond saw the value of these for instruments other than their own organs in the 1960s and they set up a separate division, Accusonics, now Accutronics, which went on to license the units to Fender and other manufacturers and thus spring reverb found its way into hundreds of thousands of guitar amplifiers the world over. The reverb tank operates in a very simple way. A suitable audio signal is fed into a transducer that turns that signal into mechanical movement that imparts kinetic energy into physical springs. The energy now present in the spring travels up and down it, causing a series of delays, and is then picked up by a second transducer and sent to a suitable recovery circuit that amplifies it and sometimes also features a basic tone shaping EQ. It's important to get the correct impedance going into the transducer to correctly drive the spring, or it can result in poor sound quality, lots of noise, huge frequency discrepancies, or no sound at all. And that's the difficult bit when you're trying to make a DIY spring reverb unit from an old reverb tank. I've borrowed this spring tank from our Hammond organ, and a quick Google search has told me that it operates at 180 ohms, so I need a suitable circuit to drive it at that kind of impedance and with sufficient level. There are off-the-shelf solutions such as the Tank Driver 500 series unit from Radial, but these cost a few hundred quid and you need a 500 series rack and power supply to house one. So that got me thinking, what else can we use to drive it? Well, a suitable solution for that is much easier than you might think, and you've probably already got one, a headphone output. That will feed the tank just fine and dandy, and we can take the output of the tank and feed it back into an instrument level input on the audio interface, i.e. one designed to accept signals from just such a transducer, or a DI box. And as 99.999% of reverb tanks have RCA connections on them, all we theoretically need to make this work is one of these a twin jack to phono cable, and any EQ necessary can simply happen in the DAW once we've got the reverb into it. So let's plug it in and see what happens. Okay, so we have the reverb tank going into the claret, and we have sprangliness. So if you slowly turn the headphone up, I'll play some vocal and we should get some reverb. Words come easy, come tumbling easy. from my lips in the light. Right, and right, right up, yeah, there Every we go. Every word of smile behind my eyes. You lie to fire in my mind. I never oh, get tired. I never get tired. Talking about you. Talking about you. Oh, no, no, talking no. about you. Talking about you. That sounds great, doesn't it? Talking yep. about you. Talking 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 about you. Brilliant. Let's try a bit of guitar. Oh, yeah. Tasty. So it's probably going to feed back if I turn it up too much because we've got a software monitor on, so I don't want to turn it up too much, but. Brilliant. Now, one, one of the good things about spring reverb is the low-end response is really good, so it's great for a really dark, low reverb. So let's stick the kick and snare through it. Add in the overhead as well. Let's go all the way. It's got that pingy, splatty sound. Love it. And it sounds chunky. Yeah.
So that sounds great. I've got genuine mechanical spring reverb on my track for free, but there are some issues. Namely, I've got everything coming out of the headphone socket going through the reverb and no way to control the levels of reverb on individual channels in the mix. So let's look at two easy ways to get around this. Firstly, I can leave everything connected as it is, headphone out into the tank, tank out into the instrument input or DI box, and then simply record the reverb back into a spare channel for every source I want it on. So if I solo the vocals and record the output of the tank back into a spare channel, that will give me a vocal reverb on a dedicated channel that I can then adjust the level of in the mix simply by moving the fader. I can then also EQ the reverb separately and process it in any way I want in the DAW. So that's a good way to go if a little time consuming. Another option would be to use a separate headphone mix using aux ends as you would when sending a separate headphone mix to a musician. Then if I want a tiny bit of spring on the snare and more on the guitar, I can control that using the send levels. The third way is to use separate outputs on my audio interface and I have eight outputs in addition to the two monitor outs on my focus right and then I can run those line level outputs that won't drive the tank through a headphone amplifier and drive the tank with that. If I want a stereo reverb then I'll need two tanks but I can send what would be the left ear to one tank and the right ear to the other using a simple quarter inch TRS to twin RCA slash phono cable and I love this so much I think that's what I'm going to do. Mount two of these in a rack and simply set up a Q-Mix in the Focusrite control software or DAW to send to the tanks and then print the returns as separate tracks. But what if you haven't got a Hammond organ or suitable guitar amp hanging around to borrow the reverb tank from? Well, you can buy reverb tanks brand new for very little money, around 20 to 30 pounds in the UK and a similar amount of dollars in the US. But you might end up overwhelmed with the sheer choice of seemingly identical looking tanks on offer. And you do need to make sure you end up with one with a suitable impedance if you want to easily drive it with a headphone amp. And that's where the seven digit model numbers come in so let's take a quick look at the most important of those but there is a free pdf available on our website that breaks each digit down in detail and the link is in the description the first digit denotes the type of tank and there are three common types the type 4 which is the Hammond slash Accutronics classic as we have here and also found in the Fender Twin Reverb. That's just under 17 inches long and contains four counterwound and coupled springs. This is really the industry standard and will give you a great blend of lo-fi springiness and hi-fi reverbness. The second is the Type 8, one of which we have here, and that's a shorter unit at just over nine inches in length and contains three single springs or none in the case of this one. This is commonly found in smaller guitar amps such as the Fender Blues Junior. Last up is the Type 9, which is basically double this. Six springs giving the fullest, richest reverb. The second digit of the model number denotes the input impedance, and that's the important one for DIY and is a letter. For use with a headphone amp, we ideally want a model B or C, which will give us an input impedance of between 150 and 240 ohms, depending on the type and size of tank. So for a four spring classic as found in Hammonds and Fender Twins the world over, that you can drive with a headphone amp, you want the first digit of the model number to be four for the type and the second digit to be B or C. The third digit ideally needs to be C to give a high output impedance suitable for being amplified by the instrument instrument input on a standard audio interface, but this isn't so critical if you're using a DI box, as a good one of those will match the output impedance anyway. The last digit, the seventh one, denotes the orientation in which the tank should be mounted, and this can be important. Some are designed to be mounted horizontally, open side up or open side down, some vertically, connector side up or connector side down, some on their end, input up or input down, so pay attention to that as well, and all that information with the letter codes is available in the free PDF on the website. But what if you wanna go bigger? much bigger. What if you hanker after that sound made famous by the AKG BX units that are changing hands for thousands of pounds on the used market? Well, then you'll need one of these. And once you've finished playing with it on the stairs, you can make a great sounding reverb unit out of one of these and a handful of parts for pretty much pocket change. So make sure you watch the next video to hear how it sounds and find out how you can do it. And if you're watching this after we've uploaded that, then you can click on the thumbnail that's already coming up on your screen right now. Thanks for watching, we'll see you in the next one.